I, my name is Sir Randazzo, um, and I will be helping to lead the session today. Uh, so this is going to work really similarly to the way past exam reviews have worked. Um, basically, we're going to start with a lecture um, and try and cover, you know, most of what you all have covered uh, this semester. And then we're going to go into uh, smaller breakout rooms for a little recitation section. Um, that being said, uh, during this lecture, uh, if you all have any questions, feel free to either raise your hand uh, or put it in the chat and um, the other moderators um, will, will go and, and answer your question. So with that being said, um, let's move ahead. So the first topic we're going to talk about today are, are carbonyls, right, or aldehydes and ketones. And we're going to start with an overview, um, some more theoretical stuff. Uh, we're going to go into hydration, um, you know, making uh, hemiacetals and acetals. And then we're going to go through a brief summary of the reactions. So as y'all should know by now, uh, carbonyl just refers to this C double bond O functional group. Um, and we have two major types of carbonyls, and those are going to be our aldehydes, right, which have a hydrogen on our carbonyl carbon, and we have um, a ketone, which has two R groups on our carbonyl carbon. And it's also worth pointing out that there's a minor resonance structure for carbonyls. Um, since oxygen is electronegative, uh, we have a, a resonance structure um, where the the basically the the double bond will flip up onto the oxygen and leave its one pair there, giving the oxygen a delta minus charge and the carbonyl carbon a delta positive charge. Um, so now we're going to go into some synthesis of carbonyls. Um, firstly, uh, th this is stuff we've seen before, right? We can oxidize. So uh, we'll, we'll see if we have an alcohol. Um, we can take either a strong or a weak. Um, we, we can take a strong or weak oxidizing agent and oxidize that into a carbonyl. If we have a secondary alcohol, regardless of our um, regardless of our oxidizing agent, we'll get a ketone. But for primary alcohols, um, we we need to be careful because if we use a strong oxidizing agent, we'll go all the way to the carboxylic acid. Um, whereas if we simply have a uh, a weak oxidizing agent, that'll give us our aldehyde. It's also worth noting that if we treat our aldehyde with a strong, um, with a strong carboxylic, or sorry, with a strong oxidizing agent, uh, then we will also get the carboxylic acid. Um, so that being said, here are some other reactions we've talked about. Um, you should remember ozonolysis, which basically we cleave our, uh, our alkene right down the middle and add um, and add a carbonyl to both sides. Um, but we also have things like our hydration of alkanes, right? Oxymercuration, demercuration, which adds a, mar uh, adds a carbonyl, Markovnikov, uh, or hydroboration, which adds a carbonyl, anti-Markovnikov. So most of what this unit was, was looking at nucleophilic attacks of, of carbonyls, right? So the first time we saw that was with what we called hydration, um, where essentially we have this equilibrium reaction where our carbonyl turns into two alcohols on the same carbon. And we have kind of two mechanisms for the way that happens. We have a base catalyzed mechanism, right, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's catalyzed by a base, hydroxide. And we have our acid catalyzed mechanism. And it's worth walking through these. So with our base catalyzed mechanism, um, we see essentially a direct nucleophilic attack of the carbonyl by hydroxide, right? So that's what you see here. And since we can't have five bonds to a carbon, we're going to kick that up onto our oxygen, right? And that'll leave us with a, a minus charge on that oxygen. So all we do after that is protonate. Um, assuming we're in water, right, we're, we're doing hydration, um, we'll just take any old water molecule floating around and protonate that. And so we have our hydrated. Uh, or hydrated carbonyl. Acid catalyzed is very similar, except we need to kind of preface our reaction um, by protonating our carbonyl, right? And that's going to give our carbonyl positive charge, um, which is going to have the effect of making, uh, of essentially prepping, prepping our carbonyl carbon for attack. Um, 
that's going to do again is very similar. We're going to take water and attack our carbonyl carbon. Um, that's going to give us uh, a, that, that's going to take away the charge from this oxygen up here. That was our carbonyl oxygen, um, but we're still going to have a positive charge on this oxygen. And so what we do at the end is very simply deprotonate again with just any water molecule floating around in solution. And you see again that we have our um, our diol, our hydrated carbonyl. Um, and when when we're talking about hydration, um, not all carbonyl carbons are gonna, um, or sorry, not all carbonyl compounds are going to um, have the same kind of equilibrium uh, with, with this um, with, with this hydration. So there are two considerations overall that we should take into account. Um, the first is sterics. Um, if we have a bulkier, um, a bulkier carbon, or, or yeah, if we have a bulkier uh, molecule, then it's going to be more difficult for nucleophilic attack to occur. That that almost goes back to, um, if y'all remember SN2, right? We said that you couldn't do um, SN2 on something like a tertiary carbon. Um, it, it's very similar. If we have, like, again, like over here, we see how this this aldehyde has um, a pretty bulky group attached to it. So it's going to uh, essentially be less favorable for nucleophilic attack to occur there um, than, for example, up here, where we just have um, basically nothing at all in the way of that attack. Uh, so again, less substituted is more reactive. So we, in general, will see that aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Uh, we also want to take into account electronics, right? So uh, that's essentially um, the inductive effect of our groups. Uh, we're generally going to see that the polarity of um, ketones is greater than aldehydes. And uh, we're not going to go into that too much, but it has to do with uh, our resonance structures that we talked about before. Um, but the hydrate actually decreases our polarity, right? Um, because if you think about it, um, these groups cancel each other out a little bit. So what we need to know um, is ultimately that more electron withdrawing groups is going to favor the hydrate form. And the reason for that is because um, if we think about it like this, uh, we can kind of, if they're electron withdrawing, then we're going to make um, this carbonyl, uh, the carbonyl carbon, more positive, right? We're, we're withdrawing electrons away from that. And if we're making that more positive, then it's obviously going to be kind of more primed for nucleophilic attack. So that's another thing to remember. Electron withdrawing group equals more reactive. Um, and, and in general, and I, I've kind of already hinted at this, um, but we're going to see that when we have a C double on O, this, this paradigm of the nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carbon and kicking up that oxygen is going to be really important. And we see that basically for the rest of this, uh, the rest of this exam unit. Um, this mechanism is also important um, in in this context of uh, protecting groups, where basically we do the same thing, uh, th this hydration mechanism, um, but with an alcohol, and specifically um, with this with this diol. So what we see again, same kind of thing, um, where we you know attack our carbonyl carbon, and then we do it again with the other one to you know. Uh, get rid of that OH, and we form um, this this protecting structure, a cyclic acid. And that's important because that means we can kind of selectively react um, different carbonyls within our molecule. And for this selectivity, it's important to note that aldehydes are more reactive than ketones, um, at, like we got at before. And uh, what that means is that if we put one equivalent of one, one molar equivalent of our uh, protecting molecule in, right, our, our diol, then it's going to selectively, um, it's going to selectively protect our, our aldehyde, which means we, we can then go on and react our ketone however we will. And then we just, we simply deprotect our aldehyde um, in either acid or base water. Um, and th again, that's very similar to, that, that's essentially the reverse of the mechanism we saw before. Um, so as far as some other reactions, um, we want to talk about uh, reduction of carbonyls. 
we have kind of our classic reduction. We might have talked about this in the past, um, where you take either LAH, right, lithium aluminum hydride or sodium boral hydride, and that's going to reduce um, basically any carbonyl into um, into its corresponding alcohol, right? So we basically just add a hydrogen there and add a hydrogen there. Um, but there's also some kind of more specific uh, reductions for carbonyls. One example is this um, this reagent here, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to uh, selectively reduce aldehydes in the presence of ketones. Um, so it's important to note here that we have to have a ketone um, and that ketone is going to be unaffected, but our aldehyde is not. So this reagent only works if we have both a ketone and an aldehyde present in that same solution. Um, other reactions, uh, or sorry, other reductions that are important are, are, are Clemenson and wolf kishner reductions. And essentially what those do is replace these two bonds to oxygen with just two bonds to hydrogen, right? You can see how these uh, blue carbonyls here are just replaced with two hydrogens. So our carbonyl, car our, our carbonyl carbons uh, get rid of the oxygen and are simply replaced with these two hydrogens. And here are the reagents. Um, so we also have some nitrogen derivatives of aldehydes and ketones, um, which, uh, again, they, we, they use the same mechanism we've been talking about. Um, with, with nucleophilic attack, um, and it just depends on what our nucleophile is, um, what we get, right? So we have, for example, our imines, um, which we'll get when we react our carbonyl with either ammonia, right, NH, or primary amines. Um, we'll have hydrozones, which are specifically when we have hydrazine, uh, oxymes with uh, NH2OH, or enamines with secondary amines, right? And we can't react with uh, tertiary amines because if you think about it, um, that nitrogen will then have uh, four bonds, right? So it'll be positively charged and we can't go any further from there. Um, and, and here's uh, our, um, our example mechanism of our amines. Um, again, we'll, we're showing acid catalyzed here. Um, so we'll protonate our carbonyl, um, our carbonyl oxygen, just like we talked about. Um, we'll do our nucleophilic attack and kick up that double bond, right? So now we have this um, four bonded nitrogen, right? So it's positively charged and we have our OH. Um, and this is, this is the step where I said we can't use a tertiary mean, right? Because what we need to do now is a proton transfer, right? We need to get rid of one of those protons. Um, and put it essentially up there. And then what we'll see is that um, the nitrogen will now form a double bond and use this H, uh, H2O, right? Literally just water as a leaving group. Um, so we'll, we'll take away water and get to here, right? Um, this is essentially a protonated amine. And then we deprotonate that and get to our amino overall. And again, um, we'll see really similar, if not the same mechanisms for our other uh, nitrogen carbonyl derivatives. And one, uh, maybe the most important reaction that y'all are going to be doing with carbonyls um, is the Wittig reaction. And this is important because we can form new carbon bonds, which is something we've had, you know, very limited experience doing before. Uh, and there are essentially two parts to it. So the first is we need to make our carbon nucleophile, right? Just like when we had Grignard, we had a carbon that was an electrophile, right? For example, something like this. We had a carbon that was an electrophile, and then we wanted to make it into a nucleophile. So we react it with, uh, with magnesium. That'll give us um, our Grignard reagent, which as we know, reacts like this. So we do a really similar thing with Wittig, right? Um, that's what we call our phosphorus elide. So our elide formation um, essentially takes this phosphorus compound, right? And we do SN2 with another electrophile, right? So here you see even the same electrophile that I showed you up top. 
reason two to replace that um, that bromine or what any leaving group, right, with this um, with this phosphorus compound, and that gives us what we call a phosphonium ion. Um, and what that phosphonium ion is going to do is it's going to make uh, this hydrogen next to it, right, really acidic. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, first of all, you see all these phenyl rings, right? So we know we have a lot of resonance. Um, um, fairly electron uh, electron withdrawing. And so what that's going to do is make this proton acidic, and we can just take it off with, you know, pretty much any base. So, for example, something like hydroxide. And again, that's going to form our phosphorus elide. And you, again, you see we have, we now have um, a negatively charged carbon. So that's going to be our carbon nucleophile. The next step is to react that with an electrophile. And for the Wittig reaction, we specifically use um, our carbonyl, right? And the way this is going to work is, again, we take our nucleophile, we attack our carbonyl carbon and kick it up. Um, and then we see something that we maybe haven't seen before. Um, but if you just follow the arrows, it, it should be pretty straightforward, right? We're essentially making a double bond here and a double bond there. And what that does is remove our oxygen and the phosphorus compound and leave our um, our carbonyl substituents and uh, our phosphorus elide substituents double bonded together. And if that's, um, don't worry too much about following that. Um, overall, you can just remember that um, when we do the Wittig reaction, right? So first we form our phosphorus elide and then we, um, and then we do the Wittig reaction part. Um, what we're gonna do is ultimately um, take our, um, we're going to take our substituents, right? Um, and we're going to form a double bond um, between here, this um, this carbon here, and um, and this here, right? Our carbonyl carbon. So if you just line it up, um, you'll, you'll see that we can kind of uh, just simply do that. Uh, so now we're going to get into some carboxylic acid derivatives. Yeah, and thank you, Ciro, for giving that great overview of carbonyls. For carboxylic acid derivatives, we're going to be looking at how resonance and leaving groups affect our reactivities and also just some interconversion reactions. Let's get into that. Um, so just starting with the basics, when you look at a carboxylic acid derivative, you're going to be looking for a carbonyl and then some sub substituent that can be a chlorine, it can be an alkoxide ion, or it can be um, even just like an amine. And that will determine a lot about our structure. But in general, all of our structures look about the same. So we're starting with something pretty nice. Um, another thing to note is that there is uh, there are resonance structures for carboxylic acids. Um, that is helpful for a lot of cases, um, in which case we may be reforming um, carbonyls or in like you'll see later with our enol and enolate reactions. Um, yeah. So um, how do we get to a carboxylic acid? Um, to form a carboxylic acid, there's a couple different ways, um, starting with just some of the basic reactions that you saw last semester. You can use warm co concentrated um, KMnO4 with uh, alkynes and also uh, with your, well, alkyne, alkenes and alkynes, sorry, that should be alkenes, or double bonds. Um, and one thing to look out for on alkenes is any pesky methyl groups. Those will impede the formation of a carboxylic acid simply because they'll form a ketone. Um, ketones can't oxidize to carboxylic acids very easily. Um, and yeah, the same goes here. You can just split that triple bond and form two carboxylic acids at both of those points. Um, yeah, and some more synthesis reactions include, um, you can use a Grignard's reagent on carbon di dioxide, uh, create a carboxylation reaction. Uh, we're gonna attack that electrophilic carbon and uh, sort of bump off one of those double bonds and form a carboxylic acid. Um, and we already looked at oxidation a bit um, previously. Uh, you're going to be using a strong oxidizing agent for aldehydes. Remember, not you cannot oxidize a ketone to a carboxylic acid, no matter what reagent you're trying for that. Like, 
or at least any strong oxidizing agent. Um, and there is also one other option to form carboxylic acids that involves methyl ketones, um, where you can add on, you can add, halogenate that alpha carbon here and form carboxylic acid by like having this leaving group to leave and attaching our alcohol. We're going to be looking at that in more detail later on in the slides, but look out for that. Um, yeah. And as I said earlier, substituent matter, substituents matter a lot. Um, you're going to be looking at the different um, substituents of our carboxylic acid derivatives that can include our chlorines and so on, uh, like until like carboxylic acids even. Um, and one thing to remember about carboxylic acid derivatives is that you can only, you can really only form lower, like lower energy derivatives from higher energy derivatives. So you're going to be going from a more reactive um, derivative such as like acid chlorides to something less reactive such as like amides um, in the cases where you're trying to go in the opposite opposite direction. That's going to be really hard simply because um, nature in general enjoys cause, creating like an increase in stability. And because of that, you're going to want to create something more stable, less reactive. Um, another thing to consider, consider is that leaving groups for more reactive car carboxylic acid derivatives tend to be better than the ones of less reactive ones. So for example, chlorine is more likely to get kicked off than um, our alkoxide ion. So keep that in mind as we go through the following reactions. Um, yeah, so for carboxylic acid derivatives, you tend to see um, we have the exact same idea as our alk carbonyls. You're going to be seeing a nucleophilic reaction of two different forms. We're going to be seeing base catalyzed mechanisms in which um, we're going to see our we're going to see a nucleophile come up, attack our electrophilic carbon, um, take up one of those double bonds, um, and create our hydrate form. Um, and then from there on out, we're going to see one of those leaving groups leave. In this case, exactly what I was talking about, you're going to see that chlorine leave instead of the alkoxide ion because it is a better leaving group. Um, and for acid catalyzed mechanisms, it also takes a little more effort. You're going to need to protonate that uh, carbonyl oxygen first. And once that is protonated, you can, like you've successfully destabilized the compound, um, and you can use your nucleophile to attack and create that same sort of compound um, or create, like cause a leaving group to leave and create that same sort of like reaction. Um, however, um, something to note for these is that base catalyzed mechanisms, mechanisms work best with really good electrophiles such as acid chlorides and anhydrides. Um, you're going to be doing this with something that is extremely reactive to begin with. Um, versus with like our acid catalyzed mechanism, this is for our more like our less reactive carboxylic acid derivatives, such as our esters, our amides, and our carboxylic acids. So do look out for that. Um, it's mostly just making destabilizing our carboxylic acid derivative a little more so that we can create that reaction. So. Some other important reactions that you should know, know is um, one of them is the Fischer esterification. Um, you're going to be looking at an ester and an alcohol. Um, and what you're going to be seeing is that same nucleophilic attack. We're going to see our alcohol attack our protonated, our protonated uh, carbonyl carbon. Um, and essentially, you're going to see that reaction happen. This is under acidic conditions. Um, and you will see one of these. Um, Leaving groups like what there be like a proton shuffle. Um, this proton is eventually given off to our other alcohol, causes that to leave as water, and we are left with a new ester that has formed. So um, something to note: we're attacking at the carbonyl. So um, make sure that that is reflected when you draw out your ester. And there's also a number of reducing agents for carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, we're always trying to get to something else. So um, starting with LAH, you're going to be trying to create um, 
LIH works as a very strong reducing agent because of this. It fully reduces um, most carboxylic acid derivatives, including acid chlorides um, for our esters and so on out. Um, but on the other hand, you do want to have reducing agents that are more selective or don't fully reduce RV agents. Sometimes we want something else. So um, for Dibol, you'll see that um, acid chlorides are still fully reduced. However, um, esters, um, th this is really important for esters, esters tend to be um, partially reduced to aldehydes. The same occurs for amides and nitrile groups. Um, and, uh, but then the question arises, how do I do that for my acid chloride? Maybe I want an aldehyde coming out of my acid chloride. Perfectly normal. Um, so you want to use an LTDA in that case. That is lithium triterbutoxyl aluminum, but that's a very long name. Um, and you're going to be, in, in that case, you can see that it partially reduces all of our carboxylic acid derivatives again. And you see that same reaction, but this time, more importantly, it does so for acid chlorides. Um, and finally, rainy nickel, you're going to see that rainy nickel doesn't really affect most carboxylic acid derivatives, but it does help reduce nitriles, and it, you may also see it reduce double bonds or multiple bonds. Hi, everyone. That, so, oh, sorry, Ria. Oh, no. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Zero. He's going to talk about some nitrogen containing carboxylic acid derivatives. Hi everyone. So yeah, um, there there are a few things to note when we're talking about um, nitrogen-containing carboxylic acid derivatives. The first is about nitriles, um, which don't seem like carboxylic acid derivatives, right? We just have a C triple bond N. Um, but the reason we categorize them as such is because um, they hydrolyze into a carboxylic acid um, again under hydrolysis. Um, so Obviously, uh, that, that's one way of forming them, right, in this equilibrium we have. Um, but we can also go all the way back to last semester. We, we made them with SN2, right? We use um, NaCN, uh, sodium cyanide, in order to do SN2, which we, we've talked about. Um, we have some reductions of nitriles, um, which are an important reaction. Um, and you can refer to the chart we just, uh, we just talked about. And furthermore, we, we have a couple other um, means of synthesis. One is the dehydration of, of, of amides, um, which is, you know, very, uh, very specific. All we're doing is pretty much um, we, we take our amide and um, we, we get rid of the oxygen and the H2 as H2O, right? So that's our pink stuff. And then we're left with a triple bond between our carbonyl carbon, or what was our carbonyl carbon, and our nitrogen. And you don't need to worry too much about that mechanism. Um, and there, if there's one more thing to know about nitrogens and carboxylic acids derivatives, um, is that when we take our, so when, when we do those um, reactions I was talking about before, um, if we, we would expect to get our, um, our imine and our enamine, right? If we just do what we did before and then just have an OH um, pretty much adjacent to um, our nitrogen, or in this case, uh, to our carbon. Um, but the problem with, um, with this is that we actually get um, amides, right? So um, we, we don't get the expected product. And the reason for that is that we undergo what we call tautomerization. And essentially what that is, is um, we have two uh, constitutional isomers which rapidly interconvert. And that typically um, comes from just a change in a proton and a double bond. So we see here, right, um, that in order to get from this um, imine to the amide, all we're doing is moving this hydrogen from our oxygen to our nitrogen and kicking that double bond up, right? So um, that, that's all we're doing, the proton transfer to go from our imine to our amide. And our amide is going to be more stable, right? Um, and similarly for our enamine here. So 
if you are doing um, that nitrogen carbonyl chemistry on, um, on a carboxylic acid, just make sure you don't forget this extra step. Uh, and that being said, uh, that, that gives us a good segue into enols and enolates because tautomerization uh, comes out to be really important here. So we're going to start by looking um, at an overview and specifically note um, carbon as a nucleophile because that's another important part of enols. And then we'll go into some more reactions. So um, for the formation of enolate ions, um, the whole, so the whole point of using enolates is that this hydrogen here, uh, our alpha hydrogen, is going to be pretty acidic. And the reason for that has to do with, um, with resonance, right? If we, we, we have resonance here, um, where basically our negative to come up and um, form the double bond and uh, give our oxygen a negative charge. So that's our enolate anion. Um, that's going to be fairly stable. And similarly, um, we see that here we can use acids to, to protonate that oxygen, essentially resulting in the same thing. Um, all we need to do is use a strong base to deprotonate that, um, to deprotonate that hydrogen. And the reason we bring this up in the, the context of, um, of tautomerism is that keto enol tautomerism is essentially the most famous instant, like instant uh, instantiation of tautomerism, right? We go between our enol form, um, right? So alkene with an alcohol, hence the enol, um, and our ketone form. And generally, the ketone form is preferred. Um, so that being said, we also um, want to talk a little bit about um, acidity of relative acidity of alpha carbons. Um, so as I already mentioned, it's a resonance stabilized conjugate base anion, um, which gives us that acidic proton, right? Um, and, and that's going to obviously be true for all um, for all enolates. But um, we want to keep in mind that more resonance in the conjugate base is generally going to make it more acidic, right? So we can think about that as having, um, essentially, the more enolate, I, or the, the, sorry, uh, the more uh, carbonyls to which this is the alpha hydrogen for, um, the more acidic it's going to be, right? Because now we can have resonance with all three of those carbonyls, uh, versus here, we can only have resonance with two or only one. Um, so again, more, more resonance is going to be you know, more, more acidic. Um, but we also want to take into account um, inductive effects, right? And, and we talked about these last semester as well. But if we have an electron withdrawing group um, somewhere near our alpha carbon, that's going to mean it's going to be less acidic. Um, sorry, an electron withdrawing group um, is going to be less acidic right? Because it's essentially, um, sorry, wait, this is, all right, sorry, um, I believe this is, this might be backwards. Um, if we have uh, an electron uh, withdrawing group attached, then we're going to be less acidic um, because we're uh, essentially, um, oh, sorry, all right, yeah, I, I would just remember that an electron group is going to be less acidic. Um, an electron donating group is going to make it more acidic, right? And you, you see that here. Um, and now uh, I just want to go over real quickly why um, enols and enolates um, are useful, right? So I, I kind of alluded to this before when talking about the Wittig reaction. Carbon is typically an electrophile, but now we can make it a nucleophile. Um, and we've seen some reactions like this before, right? Um, we talked about Grignard and Wittig. Um, we talked about our acetylide anion um, back in last semester as well. That was our um, when we deprotonate our terminal alkyne, right? So this guy. And we also talked about uh, our lithium reagents. Um, Essentially, what enols do is expand um, 
expand the ways we can add carbon. Um, and, and two of those major reactions are going to be our aldol and Claisen condensations. So aldol reactions, um, again, they, they, they follow the same exact paradigm, right? So we have our, we, we deprotonate our alpha carbon, like we talked about. Um, and that's going to do nucleophilic attack on our electrophilic carbonyl carbon, right? And so when we do that, um, we'll see that we form uh, an alpha beta hydroxy ketone. And all that means is that um, when we attack, we're going to kick up that oxygen, right? And that's going to turn into an alcohol. Um, and so we have on our alpha carbon, um, just a, we're going to be adding a hydrogen. And on our beta carbon here, um, we see our OH. Um, and again, uh, we can also do this in acidic conditions. But uh, the auto condensation um, is specifically when we apply heat, right? So when we apply heat, um, we undergo um, an, an elimination mechanism, uh, kind of similar to what we talked about with E1 and E2, where this OH and the hydrogen on this carbon are going to essentially leave as water, right? and form uh, a double bond. And what that leaves us is our alpha, beta, and saturated ketone, um, which we'll see uh, has you know its, its own uses uh, in a little bit. So just to point out, this alpha, beta comes from the fact that here's our alpha carbon, and here's our beta carbon. And obviously, there's one degree of unsaturation between these two. Um, so oh, again, as a summary of that, um, we see that overall, um, uh, we, we wind up forming um, essentially a double bond um, in our alpha carbon of one, uh, of one, right? And what was our carbonyl carbon of the other? So these R groups are going to stay on that carbon, and uh, essentially the rest of this molecule is going to stay. Um, so it's also worth noting that, um, well, we showed uh, the auto reactions as being within the same molecule. We can use different molecules. The problem with that is that uh, we, we then start to see, um, you know, multiple possibilities, right? So if we're doing uh, crossed auto reactions, right? Um, essentially, auto reactions between different carbonyl compounds, we we kind of have uh, some ways to to control it. So one of those ways is to use one compound that doesn't have any alpha carbons at all, right? If, for example, we take uh, this, this here, um, we'll see that there are no alpha hydrogens. So this cannot um, become our enolate nucleophile. Uh, so that's forced to become our electrophile. And this one on the right, this carbonyl on the right, into our enolate anion. Uh, and you know, attack as a nucleophile. Um, so the other way of doing it is essentially um, we want to form our uh, enolate ion first um, by adding LDA to our preferred nucleophile. Uh, and then uh, kind of we, we can selectively um, we, we can selectively make this into our um, our enolate and attack um, attack our our other carbonyl like that after. And what this is going to do is essentially um, give us specificity in which carbon becomes our nucleophile. That being said, um, you'll also you might also see that uh, we risk having you know our own um, reactions with ourselves here. Uh, like we we react th this molecule we react with another. Um, but you know that's just unavoidable in some cases. Another important note about the uh, the aldol condensation is that we can have it intramolecularly. Um, so what we want to do is essentially find um, a carbonyl and an alpha carbon that are either five or six carbons apart, and it has to be five or six carbons apart because aside from that, there's going to be too much ring strain in order to do that intramolecular reaction. So here we see that this blue carbon. Um, this blue carbonyl carbon to a red alpha carbon is six carbons apart. And that tells us that we can do this cyclic aldol condensation. So what we're going to do is draw a double bond between 
uh, those two carbons, right? So here. And then we're going to construct a ring with the appropriate number of carbons, which we should know because we just numbered, right? So we know we have a six membered ring between our neocarbon and our alpha carbon. That's here. And then we quote unquote decorate, right? So all we do is attach all the stuff that, um, that is still on this molecule. Uh, we need to remember that our carbonyl carbon is no longer going to be there, right? We, we essentially eliminated that. Um, and so on carbon one, we're only going to have whatever this remaining substituent is, right? And then we see carbons two, three, four, and five have nothing on them, which is reflected here. And then carbon six still has this carbonyl group attached to it, right? So that's going to go on carbon six. Um, and that's, that's our cyclic alkyl condensation. The other kind of important condensation we have is the Kleising condensation, um, which is essentially the same thing, except we do it with esters. Uh, so we'll see a slightly different step at one point. Um, but again, we're, um, we're doing that nucleophilic reaction of esters uh, where we take off, um, where, where we essentially deprotonate our alpha carbon here, we attack our carbonyl, uh, and we form a bond between those two. The difference that we see here um, is that rather than rather than um, having an OH, we have we actually have a leaving group on this on this carbonyl, right? So what's going to happen is we're going to reform our carbonyl and kick off um, kick off this OH. So or, or sorry, kick off this uh, this alkoxide OR. Um, one important thing to note here is that when we're doing Kleising condensations, um, we want to use the um, we want to use the alkoxide that's the same as whatever the alkoxide of our ester is, right? And the reason for that is because we're going to have a competing reaction here um, where this alkoxide, rather than acting just as a base, uh, might act as a nucleophile. And so if it happens and it attacks our carbonyl, um, we want to make sure that we just reform the same ester. If we had something else, we might reform a different ester, and then we would get you know products we didn't want. Um, so that being said, again, here's the overview of the Kleising condensation. Um, and this one might be the simplest of all, where we essentially take uh, this half and stick it onto our alpha carbon on the other half. Uh, and that forms what we call our uh, beta keto ester, right? So we have a ketone um, on the beta carbon of our ester. So hence beta keto ester. And just like aldols do cyclic chiasm condensations, also known as Dieckmann condensations, um, we're going to do this really similar, you know, numbering thing um, where we need to find our carbonyl and alpha carbon um, five or six carbons away. In this case, it's five. Um, like I said, we're not going to be um, dehydrating uh, at any point. Yeah, we're not going to be dehydrating at any point. So uh, we can just, rather than having our double bond, um, we're going to form a single bond in that ring. Uh, that'll give us a five-membered ring in this case. And again, we just we decorate. So number one, um, we, we still have our carbonyl, so we put that on. And then on number five, we have that ester. So we're going to put that on as well. And Rhea's going to take it away with some other uh, enol and enolate reactions. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so um, another thing that, like, as we mentioned earlier, enolates are great nucleophiles, so we should use that, right? Um, so enolate ions, a lot of the time, what you can use them for is a lot of those reactions that you're not going to be able to do just by yourself with, like, a normal carbonyl. For example, adding um, a methyl or, like, adding, like, other carbon bonds. Um, so, for example, just starting with alkylations, um, you can look at um, we, we create a pretty strong nucleophile, and from here on out, you can essentially just do um, an SN2 reaction. So you will actually just see our, um, ah, our nucleophile attack kick off that bromine, and you can see the formation of a new carbon bond, carbon-carbon bond, so that we can alkylate. 
Um, and one thing to note is um, if you're given a molecule in which there are two possible carbons at which you can um, alkylate or where you can have enol, um, such as, let me draw something out for you, um, such as this. Um, something to note is that, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, Something to note is that you're going to see um, under heat conditions, you'll see that it will attack a the more substituted alpha carbonyl. Um, you'll see a thermodynamic um, formation. And so that, um, say, we attack with that same bromine, we're going to see um, that carbon-carbon bond found form on that more substituted carbon over here. Um, versus if with heat, um, versus if you are reacting under cold conditions, you're going to be seeing that reaction happen on the less substituted um, alpha carbon, uh, simply because that would be a more stable location for that electron. So it looks something like this, I believe. So um, yeah, just something to note that under cold conditions, you're going to see a kinetic product where um, you'll see that a carbon-carbon bond found form on the less substituted alpha carbon versus like under a thermodynamic re reaction, you're going to see it form on that more substituted um, alpha carbon. Um, and then just moving on, diketones are also a very important um, molecule. They're, that alpha carbon here is strongly acidic due to the two carbonyls that are next to it. Um, because of that, it will act as a pretty strong nucleophile. You will see the same reaction occur, um, that SN, like that substitution reaction once more. Um, and then just looking at halogenations, um, you're going to be able to see um, halogenations happen under basic and acidic conditions. <clears throat> um, and so uh, for under basic conditions, you'll just see um, our enoly ion form causing there to be some instability and uh, forming that, like you can attach your halogens directly onto that alpha carbon. This is unlimited. Um, it's going to place all of those protons on that alpha carbon. And so here, like you'll see two bromines. Versus in acidic conditions, you'll use acidic conditions when you want to have a more controlled halogenation. They will only attach one halogen. Um, so something to keep, keep in mind in case like you want to control that or you want to just let it go. Um, and then we have one special case uh, for our halogenations, which is um, methyl ketone halogenation, where you're going to see um, we have like three hydrogens. So what that's going to what's going to happen is under basic conditions, we're going to protonate or not protonate. We're going <laughs> to deprotonate and attach three like equivalents of halogens. And this forms a really good leaving group. Um, just simply like it would carry a negative charge very easily. And because of that, you're going to see our, um, you're going to see that leave. And in its place, um, when we, if we attack with a base, you're going to see that leave. And in its place, you're going to have a carboxylic acid. This is what we, I mentioned earlier. Um, if you want to synthesize a carboxylic acid from say a ketone, um, this is a great way to do it. Um, just Remember, it has to be at a methyl ketone, um, and it's simply because um, our like having three halogens makes for a really good leaving group. Um, yeah, and the the OH groups form simply because um, we're using a base to attack at the electrophilic carbon, um, and that allows for us to create that hydrate form and kick off that good leaving group. Um, and then just uh, beta dicarboxylic acids are also very acidic. Um, they will just be attached to another ketone. Um, and so what you'll see is that under heat conditions, um, they will very quickly leave. Um, you'll see that they're pretty eager to just take, um, just take their electrons and leave. Um, you'll see um, if we, if we protonate that, oxygen, we can create um, something of a proton shuffle here too, 
where we will form our alcohol or we'll form an enol and we can just once we've kicked off that um, carboxylic acid you can tautomerize to a ketone so sometimes if you want to get rid of that carboxylic acid just heat it and okay we're moving into michael addition reactions um, michael addition is a very special kind of nucleophilic reaction. Um, you'll see it occurs with alpha beta carbonyls, um, where you're gonna see that double bond form between the alpha and beta carbon. Um, and what you need to note here is that when we create an enolate, we're gonna be seeing two major electrophilic sites appear. We're gonna see one at our four carbon and one at our carbonyl carbon. And the question arises, where does our nucleophile attack? Does it attack our carbonyl or does it attack our that? So do we have a 1, 2 addition or 1, 4? And let's go into that. So starting with just like 1, 2 additions, just your traditional um, attack at that carbonyl carbon that we've been seeing all day, um, you're going to see um, we, we use hard nucleophiles, meaning that they're strong basic bases. Um, and uh, those include our Grignard's reagent, our, our organolithium um, reagents, and um, even like our alkyl, like anilines. Um, and because of this, uh, what you'll see here is that they're, because they're very strong nucleophiles, um, they perform an irreversible attack on our carbonyl and they prevent the reformation of the carbonyl. That's like, they're not, um, they're not going to leave or cause a leaving group to leave. They're just going to um, exist as is. If you remember any of our Grignard's reactions, you remember that they're used to reduce our carbonyls and they don't allow that carbonyl to reform. Um, on the other hand, we have softer nucleophiles such as halogen, beta dicarbonyls, uh, Gilman's reagent. Um, and what you'll see with these is that um, they do attack at that carbonyl, but the issue is, is that these reagents often act as really good leaving groups, and so they won't cling on. They're going to leave immediately after. So instead, they have to go for like a different spot. Like, we failed, let's try again. And so what you'll see them do is you'll see them try and react with that other electrophilic carbon at the beta carbon. Um, and that causes our 1,4 addition. You're going to see them pop on over there and we form that carbonyl once again. Um, and yeah, so for that one, uh, something important to remember is this will also apply to most of your enol, enolate ions. Um, anything from our Michelin ion to an enolate that you form is probably gonna attack um, with one four addition versus um, just keep in mind that Grignard's and your lithium or your lithium reagents will not. Um, moving on to Robinson. Uh, Robinson is a combination of some of the reactions we just talked about. It is a combination of uh, our Michael 1,4 addition and our cyclic aldol condensation. It helps us form rings. A really common place where you may see this is the formation of, say, hormones, which have quite a few rings on them. Um, it's a really easy way to sort of get to doing that. Um, and so in Robinson emulations, we're going to be trying, we're aiming for a product with two cyclic rings and an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Um, and the essence of our reaction is simply that um, we will work with that alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. Um, we perform Michael addition that allows us to form some of those bonds um, that you need, like. You'll, that allows you to form a bond, and from there on out, you can just use the cyclic, cyclic aldol condensation um, and uh, form that double bond there. Um, a really quick way to look at that is um, if you're on an exam and you don't want to think about all the steps, um, a really quick way you can do them is you can line them up so that your alpha beta unsaturated uh, ketone is lined up with the four carbon looking at this carbon at which that's going to attack it. Um, this is going to form an enolate ion, right? So um, that will line up just so, so that this can attack 
over here and we can and form that bond. And in addition, we'll have that other carbon looking at the carbonyl, just setting us up for that cyclic aldol um, condensation. Um, and here, what you'll see is that um, you can just set them up like that, um, take off our carbonyl and create um, a bond between our nucleophilic, our, yeah, our nucleophilic carbon and our electrophilic um, beta carbon. And also see that same thing happen here where um, just replicating that um, aldol condensation that we're gonna see just a double bond form at that point um, between our alpha carbon and our the the carbonyl carbon um, so it's a pretty it looks pretty intimidating but once you get to drawing it it's not too bad so do try to remember um, that trick um, and that is about it you just want to remember you're going to create that double bond um, alpha beta uh, double bond um, and that about concludes our presentation. Thank you for coming here. Thank you to a lot of our staff at the SSC for helping us out. Um, we're gonna start breakout rooms just about now. Um, our moderators will be joining, uh, your peer, like our tutors will be joining to help y'all go through some of our packets. So this is a fairly long packet. Um, so we'll do some stuff, not all of it. Um, and yeah, we'll, ju we'll just skip around. Um, okay, so um, this first question, um, most but not all nucleophiles will react with aldehydes and ketones in a reversible manner, um, but we want to identify at least two that will react with carbonyls in a non-reversible fashion. Um, so right off the bat, we know that in order to be, um, in order to react in a reversible manner, um, what we need to do is we, we essentially need to be able to have that nucleophile attack. But then we also need to be able to see it leave again, right? So reform our double bond and kick off our nucleophile. What that tells us is that our nucleophile, in order to have a reversible reaction, needs to be a fairly good leaving group. So what, we, what we'll see about carbons that react non-reversibly is that they need to be pretty bad leaving groups. And pretty much the two um, bad leaving groups uh, of, of chemistry in general are first off carbons, right? We know that, uh, so if we, if we remove a carbon and get a carbon ion, that's gonna be you know, fairly, uh, fairly unstable, pretty angry molecule. Um, and the other one is going to be uh, hydride, right? Um, and hydrides are going to be, um, again, fairly fairly unstable. So um, what we'll see is that nucleophiles um, that will react in a non-reversible fashion are going to be, first off, um, things like uh, carbon nucleophiles. So we have, you know, things like uh, Grignards, um, or we have that acetylide ion we talk about, things like that. Um, and the other, uh, the other kind of non-reversible um, nucleophile that we'll talk about is sources of the hydride. And that's gonna be, you know, our reducing agent, things like LEH, um, NADH4, et cetera. Um, those essentially, again, they serve as sources of hydride, H minus, in solution, um, and then that hydride is going to, you know, do a nucleophilic attack on our carbonyl. Um, any questions on on that one? Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Exactly, uh, the hard nucleophiles in general are going to be, you know, um, pretty irreversible. That's why that's exactly why they are hard nucleophiles. Um, Perfect. So if there are no questions, then we'll move on to number two. Um, our favorite ranking questions. So um, we're going to be ranking by reactivity in a nucleophilic addition reaction, uh, where the most reactive is one. Um, and in order to do this, we also need to note that 
the nitro group, NO2, is, is electromotronic. So um, if you all recall, there are kind of two factors. Um, so I'm going to say two factors to consider in um, reactivity, in, in carbonyl reactivity uh, and nucleophilic condition. Um, and in this order, uh, the first one is going to be sterics. And the second is going to be electronics. So the thing to remember about sterics is again, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Um, and as far as electronics, um, we know that electron withdrawing groups um, are going to make molecules more reactive than electron donating groups, right? And so what we see then is um, we have um, essentially, uh, we'll, we'll look for our aldehydes versus ketones first. So obviously we have um, these three that I just underlined as aldehydes, and then the other two are going to be ketones. So, so let's look at our aldehydes first. Um, among those three, um, the most reactive one um, is then going to be um, the one essentially with the most electron donating groups, or, or sorry, excuse me, I misspoke. It's the most reactive is going to be the one with the most electron withdrawing groups. So the fact that these nitro groups are withdrawing um, means that this last one's going to be our most reactive. Um, and similarly, um, we can get two and three, right? Because we have a ni one nitro group on number two there, and um, we have actually an electron donating group attached, right, uh, to this one, a methyl group. So we see we, we get that order. As far as our ketones, we can again do really the, pretty much the same um, the, the same kind of logic um, and get that um, our nitro group is going to make that carbonyl more reactive um, than this methyl group. Any questions on that one? All right, if not, then we'll move on. Perfect. All right, so now we're going to rank these compounds by their equilibrium position um, under hydrolysis, right? Um, so one is going to be basically most like the carbonyl, and five is going to be most like the hydrate. Um, so this is a really similar way of, it's basically the same question as the previous one in this guise, right? Um, we know that, in general, aldehydes are going to be, um, again, aldehydes are going to be more likely um, to form the hydrate. Um, and ketones are going to be less likely to form uh, the hydrate. And then we can go on about um, about everything after, right, about the electronics. So that being said, um, right off the bat, um, we'll see here that um, we have this um, formaldehyde, right, which is going to be uh, basically the most hydrated carbonyl of them all. So that'll be the furthest right, right? We have most hydrate formed. Um, and then we can see that we also have a couple other um, aldehydes, right? And so those are going to be um, those are going to be next in the most hydrate form. Um, and we'll see that. Um, Essentially, the, this, we can use the same kind of logic um, as, as the nucleophilic attack, where um, these electron donating groups are going to kind of um, make this carbon a little less delta positive. Um, and since that carbon's less delta positive, right, so this whole thing we'll see is that um, what we'll see is likely um, to be attacked. Um, and form the hydrate. So we, we see that that one is going to be 
um, slightly less reactive, right? It's going to form less hydrate um, than is our other one here, right? So from that, we'll get uh, three and four. And then again, we can use that same exact logic um, for, for our ketones here, um, where we get basically this will be the most like the carbonyl, and that'll be um, a little less like the carbonyl. So a little more hydrate, a little less carbonyl. Any questions on that one? Yes. Hi, the key says something different. Yeah, so um, the key, of course, apologies. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry? I, I believe uh, I, I believe the key is backwards. Oh. All right. Yes. The... Um, Let me see. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I apologize. The key is backwards. Um, this should be the correct order. All right, thank you. Yeah, no worries. And then um, for number four, um, we're ranking by acidity. Um, and this we can kind of see um, brings in some old stuff, um, but also we're talking a little bit about um, about our analytes here, right? Um, we have obviously some, you know, uh, acidic alpha carbon, uh, acidic alpha hydrogens. So um, right off the bat, um, we should remember that Amines are not acidic, right? They're they're in fact pretty basic. Um, so, right, we we can pretty much say that's five right off the bat. Uh, and similarly, uh, this this OH here, um, that's going to leave us with an alkoxide. Um, versus each of these uh, carbonyls has an alpha hydrogen, which is going to ultimately um, give us um, resonance, right? So where we can delocalize that negative charge, not just on an oxygen, but also on, um, but also on, yeah, so between the carbon and the oxygen. Um, so what that's going to tell us is that our, um, our OH is also going to be less acidic. So we'll call that four. Um, and then as for the other three, right? So that's going to be those. Um, again, those are all going to form. Um, those are all going to form analytes, right? So we're specifically looking at our alpha hydrogens, and now we're going to rank those. So right off the bat, we see that this middle one um, has two carbonyls. Um, so so that this hydrogen is the alpha hydrogen for two separate carbonyls which means all the resonance, which is going to make the conjugate base most stable, uh, which makes this the most acidic. And then as for the other two, um, that gets to the whole point of um, electron withdrawing groups are going to make um, are going to make it more acidic, right? Um, because in the conjugate base, they're going to kind of withdraw some of this, um, some of this negative charge that's left here when that hydrogen leaves. And so since this conjugate base is going to be more stable than that one, we'll see that this is overall more acidic than that one. And so we get two and three. Any questions on that one? All right. Um, and we'll keep going. So um, there's also some, there's a possibility that y'all will see some spec on this exam. Um, don't know how much, 
or if any, um, but it's worth uh, it's worth bringing up anyway. So what we're doing here um, is we're reacting um, butanol, right? One butanol, um, and then we get um, we're given the IR spectra for different products, and we're supposed to um, essentially give the product and the reagents. So let's look at this um, this first spectra. Right off the bat, we see this um, this big peak, which we can uh, we already know is going to be associated with our um, carbonyl, and so that tells us that our oxygen was probably oxidized into um, into a C double bond O, right? Uh, that being said, we can we know that we can oxidize um, kind of into one of uh, one of two ways, right? So we can either go all the way. Um, we can either stop at the aldehyde, or we can go all the way to the carboxylic acid. And yeah, in the chat here, someone's kind of got it. So there, there are kind of two things here. Uh, we see these aldehyde fangs up here, right, at about you know 20, 2700. Um, and also, we, we know that it can't be this acid because um, we don't have that broad peak, right? We don't have this um, kind of broad, jagged peak um, where we would see you know, alcohols. So that tells us that we are going to, in fact, have that aldehyde. And the question then becomes, um, what reagent can we use to take our, um, our alcohol and get, in, get it into that aldehyde? Um, and what that's going to be is pretty much any weak, um, any weak oxidizing agent. Or we might also call them selective oxidizing agents. So yeah, I, I see in the chat PCC, that would work. We could also use something like SWERN. Any of those would work. Uh, any questions on that first part? OK, um, so then we'll move on to the second part. So um, what we see in, in the second part is um, really th this is the major peak here we see, right? And we know that's going to be a C triple bond N, right? A cyano group. Um, and so that, and I guess also, um, again, we see the lack of the oxygen. Um, the, the, the alcohol peak. So we know that's not going to be there. Um, so ultimately, uh, we're going to wind up um, with uh, with a cyano group, right? And I'm going to show it like this. So essentially replacing our alcohol, our OH, with, um, with a cyanide CN, right? And so how can we get from our alcohol to, um, to that, to a cyano group? Um, the way we're going to do that is, again, if you're probably the easiest way to make um, a CN in a molecule is going to be through SN2, right? So in this case, what we'll do is make our oxygen into a leaving group um, and then uh, do SN2. So the way to make it into a leaving group, um, if you all remember from the last exam, uh, we're going to tosylate it, right? So we use tosyl chloride. Um, and all that does is it pretty much makes our alcohol into a better leaving group, a tosylate. And then we can very simply do um, SN2, NACN, and that's going to give us this, right? So then our reagents will be first, um, tosyl chloride, and second, um, NACN, 
and we'll do SN2. Any questions on that one? Okay, then we will move on. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about carboxylic acids and, and their derivatives. Uh, so this first one, it has us ranking the stability of um, of the leaving group for for each molecule. Um, so uh, this is again um, something we probably could have done before, but it, it makes sense to talk about in this context. So um, let's let's draw out each leaving group um, on the bottom here. Um, for this second one, um, you, you'll see that we might have more than one leaving group. So we're going to talk about um, kind of the most stable leaving group, right? Um, and that's going to be, uh, in this case, um, that, right, our carboxylate. Um, and the reason for that is because if we you know, split it up here, uh, then we would have oxide, which isn't resin stabilized. Uh, here we see Br minus. Um, again, here we see we see that alkoxide. And then finally, um, the conjugate base of an amide or of, a, of an amine. Excuse me. So right off the bat, um, in, in general. Uh, we know that bromine is a really good leaving group. Um, and we talked about that even from, uh, you know, last semester. So I'm going to put that first. Um, also, we know that acid acid chlorides um, and or acid bromides are going to be, um, you know, the, the most reactive of the carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, so continuing onwards, um, we know if we're using the same logic, we know that anhydrides are going to be the second most reactive, right? More reactive than thionyl, um, than our um, sulfur esters, right? Our, our thioesters, um, or our esters or our amides. So we can consider that one our second uh, most stable leaving group. And by the same logic, um, we know that sulfur um, is going to be a better leaving group than oxygen. So we'll call that three and four, and finally nitrogen five. Um, and we, we can just follow the ranking. But if you want to kind of understand this more conceptually, um, sulfur is going to be a, a large. It's, it's better able to handle that negative charge. Um, and we can kind of use that to tell us why it's better than oxygen and nitrogen. And then as far as between oxygen and nitrogen, um, we know that oxygen is going to be more electronegative. So it's kind of better at holding that negative charge than this nitrogen is. Um, any questions on that one? If not, then we're actually going to skip number seven. Um, when we say rank the reactivity of each molecule with a nucleophile, um, that's essentially another way of asking number six. Um, rank the stability of each molecule's leaving group. It's, again, the same same exact trend. Um, and, and you can um, So again, we're going to include a little bit of spec here. Um, all right, so um, when we're looking at, um, at this first one, um, so uh, sorry, I should start by saying we see um, that we're looking at isomers of C4H8O2. Um, so the first thing, um, the first thing I see personally is um, 
this right here, right? Um, that little peak, uh, we can kind of tell right off the bat that that's going to be, um, I mean, it's one hydrogen with, um, with, sorry, it's going to be a septet pretty much. Um, and then we see this six hydrogen, um, the six hydrogen triplet, right? And yeah, right off the bat, we can kind of tell that between those two, we have an isopropyl, right? And that already takes care of three, uh, three of our carbons and seven of our hydrogens. So all we have at this point left are two oxygens and a hydrogen. Um, and frankly, there's like not, not much we can do with two oxygens and a hydrogen. Um, but we also see this really uh, downfield hydrogen, and, and that's going to be indicative of um, of a either an aldehyde or um, or an alcohol, right? We can see an alcohol pretty much anywhere, um, and in this case, um, we're going to see that it's going to be an acid. Um, and, and that's consistent with um, our carbonyl peak. Right. Um, so the 6H is a trip. So I will say um, right off the bat, this is old. Um, any any NMRs that you guys get will um, will tell you the integration and the multiplicity. So they would tell you this is a triplet, but you can see there's a peak there, a peak here, and a peak there. Or sorry, sorry, sorry. It should be a doublet, I believe. Yeah, my bad. It's a it's a doublet, and this is why they tell you what it is. So yeah, that's a that's a doublet. Good question. Um, and yeah, an another thing that also um, maybe we should have done before um, is is check for the degrees of unsaturation in this, um, and we'll see. Um, Normally, it's going to be, um, we normally have 2n plus 2 hydrogens in an, in an alkane, right? So that would be 10 in this case. Um, but then we actually have 8. So um, we take that, subtract it, divide it by 2, and that gives us 1 degree of unsaturation. And, and again, we, we see that here in our acid. Um, for part B, um, we, we don't see that way downfield, um, that way downfield hydrogen, right? So we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a minute here. Um, but that's, that's good to know. Uh, and the other thing is, um, we're going to have, um, so actually, I, I guess we can kind of say more more explicitly that this tells us that we don't have um, any hydrogens. Um, we don't have really any hydrogens on oxygen. Um, and then over here, um, we'll see that we have, obviously, these two are going to be uh, methyl groups, right? Uh, we know that. And I can tell you that they're both singlets. All of these are going to be singlets. So I'm going to say that. And so that tells us that those methyl groups are kind of separated from everything else, right? Um, so they're not adjacent to any hydrogens, is what I mean to say. So I'm going to put one there and one here. That takes care of. C2H6, right? Um, and then we see this other um, ethyl group here, right? And it's more downfield, um, which is important because what that suggests to us is that it's adjacent to one of our oxygens. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, and then we, again, have another fairly downfield um, fairly downfield carbon. So we'll make that one of our methyl groups. Um, and then this other one, 
on the other end um, is not adjacent to, OK, so this one is not adjacent to any other hydrogens. And also, um, we see that our final carbon doesn't have uh, any hydrogens attached, right? Because we know we have four carbons, but one of them doesn't show up here. Um, so it's a pretty fair assumption between that and the fact that we know that there's a carbonyl peak, um, that that's going to be here, right? And you can see how, in this case, um, that carbon, um, sorry, I'm, I'm missing a carbon. Um, let me redraw that. Um, yeah, so it's going to be this one down here. Um, and you can see how all of these carbons are not adjacent to any other carbons with hydrogens. So that's going to give us our three singlets. Um, we have our, our methyls on each end, right? Um, this one is going to be more downfield than that one because it's right adjacent to this oxygen. And then our most downfield of all is this, um, this two hydrogen um, singlet. And we can you know justify that by saying it's next to this carbonyl carbon and the alkoxide. So it's going to be a little further downfield than that one and more downfield than that one. Um, and any questions on that? Um, there is no ethyl. Um, and the reason that we know there's no ethyl is because there's no splitting, right? Yeah, exactly. If we had an ethyl group, um, and this is, we'll just say that that's an ethyl group, then we would see that this methyl group would be at least a triplet, right? And then this ethyl group here um, would be at least, um, at least a quartet. And depending on whatever is on this side, it might be um, you know, some more complex splitting. But since we have singlets, it has to be two separate methyl groups. And then this CH2 has to be separate. Um, does that make sense? All right, good. Uh, any other questions on this one? And again, um, we only bring this up because it's possible that it'll be on your exam. Um, we don't know for certain whether it will be or not. All right, so to move on, uh, we have one more. So uh, this last one, um, if you all remember, this um, D2O peak um, so this 3.6 peak disappearing when D2O is added uh, essentially tells us that that's due to an OH. Um, and that's just kind of some trivia that you may or may not remember um, from last semester. Um, can anyone else hear me? Interesting. Uh, maybe try refreshing. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to continue, though. So um, I am realizing, OK. Um, OK, so that tells us that we have an alcohol in our molecule, right? Uh, and then these other peaks. So here we here we see those ethyl peaks we were just talking about, right? We see that uh, three hydrogen doublet, right? Um, which is going to be a methyl adjacent to um, a methyl adjacent to two hydrogens. And then over here, uh, really downfield, um, we see that we have um, uh, one hydrogen. Um, 
sorry, we, we see that we have a one hydrogen, um, uh, a quartet, it seems like. And so uh, what that tells us, that we only have one hydrogen, is that uh, this ethyl group um, is going to have our OH there. Uh, and we can kind of see that because, um, let me, so we, we have that. So we'll see that this, um, that hydrogen is really far downfield, right? Uh, so that's going to be, um, here, I'll, I'll call it code. So here, I'll call that HA. That's going to be really far downfield because it's adjacent to our oxygen, right, our, our alcohol. Um, and it's also going to be uh, split by these three hydrogens on the adjacent methyl. And I'll call those HB. So that's going to be split into this quartet. And then we see that all these three HBs are um, basically split into a three hydrogen doublet um, by that adjacent HA. So we have that part of the molecule. Um, and then we see, again, we see this um, three hydrogen singlet. That tells us it's a methyl connected to, you know, um, something without any other hydrogens. Um, and then we, again, don't have um, another carbon. So we can, again, assume um, that we have our carbonyl without any hydrogens on it. And again, right off the bat, um, put that hydrogen, um, or sorry, put this carbon without any adjacent hydrogen carbons on that um, for the same reason as before. That takes a two carbons, and then our other two carbons were in this substituent that we just kind of put together. And so we'll see that we have um, one carbon with our OH there, and then another carbon like that. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? This is our final, final answer. Any questions on that one? OK, if not, then we can move on. Um, so we have kind of a map of uh, interconversion reactions here that we're just going to fill out. So in order to convert a carboxylic acid to an acid chloride, um, we use what we call thionyl chloride, SOCl2. Um, and in order to get that acid, or if we react that acid chloride with an acid, um, then what we see is we get an anhydride, right? And the way that works is basically um, our um, acid oxygen there will do this nucleophilic attack that we've been talking about so much. And this chloride will wind up uh, getting kicked off as that carbonyl reforms. Um, so we have that. Um, we can also react our carboxylic acid with another carboxylic acid, um, which very similarly will lead us to that same anhydride. Um, and then we can react our anhydride um, with something else to, to form an ester, right? Um, or we can react our, our ester with something else to form an ester. Um, and in both of those cases, it's just going to be an alcohol, right? Um, if we use our alcohol or alkoxide nucleophile uh, and react it with either the ester or the anhydride, we're going um, to you know, kick off one of those leaving groups and replace it um, with, our, uh, with our alcohol there. Um, in the case of the ester, um, we call that transesterification, right? Because we're essentially taking our ester and replacing our alkoxide to make a new ester. Um, and it's worth noting that um, we're going to use an alcohol to get from our uh, carboxylic acid to our ester, and that's Fischer esterification. Um, 
if we react our carboxylic acid with um, our uh, with essentially a primary amine, um, we're going to get an amide. And that's, um, we kind of brought this up in the presentation. It's a slightly different mechanism um, than what you might expect, because we're going to wind up first forming the imine and then tautomerizing, rather than just kind of um, attacking and losing hydrogen. So yeah, just, just be careful with that. When we react amines with carboxylic acids, um, we're going to form amides. Whether, yeah, you know, we're not going to form the, um, the imine or the enamine that we might otherwise think we might form. Um, and then if we react our ester with, um, if we react our ester or our anhydride um, with ammonia, we'll very similarly get um, an anamide. And then uh, it's also uh, worth remembering that if we react our amide um, with POCl3, um, that's going to essentially make it into uh, our cyano group, right, our nitrile. And then if we take any of these and we hydrolyze them, right, so either water or acid, acid or base catalyzed water, um, we'll get back to our acid. So any questions on those interconversion reactions? They are good to know. All right, good. Um, yes, I will leave it up for a second. And this is all, it'll probably be fairly more readable in the key since it's printed. Um, I'll give you like a few more seconds and then we can keep going. Can I, can I go to the next page? All right, perfect. Um, so this is something that, um, it's a roadmap, basically, um, where we got to refill, or where we have to fill in, um, you know, all the missing stuff. Um, and I don't know if they're going to do this virtually, but if you were in person, you'd almost definitely get one of these. So that being said, um, we might as well just start with A. So what are we doing going from um, here to here? Um, what we see is that we're adding a, an hydrogen to our oxygen, right? And we're adding a methyl there. So what we see is a 1-2 addition, right? Uh, and specifically a 1-2 Michael addition, where we're using um, what appears to be um, just a CH3 minus as your nucleophile. So if we use something like, yeah, exactly. If we use methyl Grignard, right, CH3MGBR, um, that's going to be a hard nucleophile. Um, which will add one, two, um, ad which will do one, two addition um, to our alpha, beta, unsaturated uh, ketone, right? And we'll, we'll see in a little bit when we go to the other side that we have a soft nucleophile here. Um, but we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. So that tells us A is going to be um, CH3MGBR. And optionally, we can include, um, we can include workup, right? Um, it, it's kind of implied, though. So I'm going to put that in brackets. We can include that if we want to. Um, OK, so that being said, that being said, um, 
let's go on to B here. So now all we're doing is we're taking that, um, that alcohol and reacting it with PCC. Um, so we already said before that PCC is a weak oxidizing agent. So in this case, um, we're, we're going to oxidize our, um, we're going to oxidize to just the ketone, right? Um, so that's going to look like that's going to look just like that, right? Uh, and then let's go to C now. Um, we we saw this kind of reaction before too, right? This first part. Um, all tosyl chloride does, and I'm going to pop this down to the bottom actually. Um, so we have. We have that for reacting with tosyl chloride, which is going to, as we know, tosylate our, our alcohol. And all that does is make it a better leaving group, right? Um, and then this second reagent, uh, PPH3 and NaOH, um, is indicative of a, another very important reaction. Um, do y'all remember which one? Exactly, right? It's going to be our Wittig, rea uh, our Wittig reaction. So the first part, PPH3, um, essentially, uh, like we kind of talked about before, is going to do SN2 and replace our, our tosylate, right? Our tosylate has become the leaving group, so we can do that. And then our NaOH, um, like we talked about, and our NaOH, like we talked about before, um, is going to just deprotonate, right? It's going to deprotonate what has become an acidic hydrogen. So we see um, here that we have that. So that's going to be, I'm not going to redraw it up here. Um, but that's going to be C. And now if we take that and react it with, um, react it with our part B, um, we'll, we'll do that by kind of lining everything up so I can hopefully convince y'all that this is, you know, not too, too difficult. So we'll take our B, um, like that, and uh, um, should B have been an aldehyde? Uh, no, B should not have been an aldehyde. And it's, if you look at, um, I know I kind of scribbled over it here, um, but we'll see that there are, yeah, sorry, there are two, there are two R groups here, right? Um, so since there are two R groups, we know we're not going to get rid of either of those. Um, and we're going to form this double bond and have these two R groups left. Yeah. Um, so... We now have that ketone, um, and we have uh, again our um, our phosphorus elide, which I just want to make sure I don't get. All right, I believe it looks like that. Okay. Obviously, our phosphorus and our negative charge. Um, and if we're doing kind of the shortcut, all we do once we line it up like that is we make a double bond between here and there, right? And then we kick off our oxygen and we kick off our phosphorus. So all that's going to look like is this, that, and that. Okay. 
And if we wanted to, we could go through the whole mechanism with the four-membered intermediate ring um, and whatnot. But this, I think, is a little easier. I will also point out, and I, I don't think you'll need to know this, but um, this would probably be the unpreferred product, um, just because it's, if you remember, uh, this is going to be Z, right? Because we have kind of the um, more substituted, um, or, or the more higher priority substituents on this side, um, whereas we're probably going to see that um, the other way is going to be favored, right? Uh, e, where we have this thing um, and switch those substituents around pretty much. But I think if you gave either on an exam, you'd be fine. So any questions on that half of the map, uh, A through D? No. OK, so then uh, do you all mind if I clear that stuff? Just so we have more room for the other half. All right, cool. Um, OK, so obviously there's nothing to fill in on this top part. Um, but nevertheless, I want to I wanna take the time to talk about what happened. So um, I, we kind of already talked about this a little before. Um, but this is going to be a, a soft nucleophile, right? In comparison to our hard, um, our quote unquote hard nucleophile, which was the green yard in, in A. Um, and the reason this is soft is because it can serve as a pretty decent leaving group. Um, and what that means is that um, we, we can attack this carbonyl, right? Um, but all that's going to happen is it's going to come, it's going to come right off again because it's it's a stable leaving group. So we ultimately see is that it might do that and then reverse, but once it attacks, um, once it attacks our four carbon here, um, we're going to see actually a, a pretty irreversible um, addition. And what's going to happen looks like this. Um, like that, this. And then I'm just going to write out NU, so I don't need to redraw that whole thing. Um, but note that it looks like that. Um, and you'll see here that we have, um, we, we make our, our enol, right? We have our OH adjacent to our alkene. Um, so we wind up adding a hydrogen here. And that's how we get 1,4, right? So we added to our 1 carbon, 2, 3, and then Oh, sorry, I'm missing, I missed a carbon there. And that's going to be our four carbon, right? So we're adding one four, and then uh, we tautomerize. So it appears as if we've done, it appears as if we've added to carbons two and four, um, even though it was actually one and four with the tautomerization. Um, are there any questions on that? I just wanted to kind of go over that real quickly again with you. No? OK. So if not, then we'll keep going. And just a reminder, um, that's one for Michael addition um, with a soft nucleophile. OK, so that being said, um, going into um, E, what, what do we see? Oh, and I apologize. This so. Um, if you're looking at this, this should actually still be 
um, an ester. So if we're going into part E, um, we're, we're going to see that um, the only thing that really changes is, yeah, we're reducing a carbonyl. And specifically, we're only reducing our aldehyde, right? So our ester and our ketones stay the same, and we're reducing this aldehyde. Uh, and the reagent to do that is going to be um, this guy, right? Like a sodium acetate borohydride or something. Um, and yeah, you just you need to remember in the presence of ketones that'll selectively reduce aldehydes. Um, and so that gives us this. And then what we see here, um, we're doing, we're in acid water, right? So that tells us we're doing some sort of catalyzed hydrolysis. Um, and what we see is that we have um, this ester and this alcohol really close together, right? Um, so all we're going to do there is an intramolecular Fischer esterification, right? A transesterification, if you will. Um, and I'm going to draw it a little further. Uh, down than the box, but essentially all we're doing is we're cutting off that OH and making a new bond between these two. So that's going to be um, a five-membered ring there, um, and then we still have that other ketone. So it's going to look something like that, and that's F. Any questions on that one? All right. Um, can I go to the next page? All right. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about enols and enolates now. I know we, um, we kind of talked a little bit about them in that past section. Um, but this first part is going to be talking about um, specifically, um, I know we mentioned that aldol and claisen condensations are similar, um, but then they differ at one point. So I want to talk about um, pretty much which point um, they differ at. So as we know, um, obviously they're going to differ with the starting materials and whatever um, whatever our reagents are. Uh, but that being said, um, we start both with um, just the deprotonation. Uh, we're going to make our, our enolate, right? So we're going to we're going to start with that first. Um, and actually, maybe I'll use the bottom, so I have more room. So we're gonna start. Um, we're gonna start by making our enolate in both cases. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna show it as base catalyzed, right? Where we. Remove that. Uh, and we're going to see the, exactly the same in Kaizen, right? Um, I'll call that CH3. Uh, no, I don't want it. Oh, no, I cleared it. So I'm just going to start with that. Um, so blue is going to be your outall. And red will be our quizen, right? So um, so we start with our deprotonation of the alpha carbon. Uh, and then, you know, in both cases, we're going to see um, that that's just going to do we feel like a talk of the carbonyl, right? So we take another another molecule, and we wind up getting we 
we wind up getting that, right? And then if we if we protonate, um, and I'll show this in orange. If we protonate, it goes um, it goes from the alkoxide side into our alcohol. And now for Kleisen, uh, again we see same kind of thing. Um, where we're going to attack. And now, in this case, in the case of Kleisen, we're not going to wind up deprotonating there, right? Um, or sorry, we're not we're not just going to wind up protonating, because um, what we see here is that we can actually um, reform our carbonyl, right? We always want to check if we can reform our carbonyl because that's going to be you know more stable um, than pretty much anything else. So that being said, we do that, and we ultimately wind up getting um, here we get our beta keto ester, right? And that's going to be the first point of major difference, right? Um, here we now have, um, and I guess I should draw a line between these. So there's our um, versus up top. We formed this um, beta beta hydroxy ketone, right? And then we see um, after that. Um, we're going to do the elimination, right? Uh, it's going to be a specific mechanism known as E1CB. Um, and you don't need to worry about that. But then we wind up getting this um, I believe. Yeah, so we wind up getting this um, alpha beta unsaturated um, unsaturated. In this case, it's an aldehyde, right? Um, and the reason we get that difference again is because for our chlysin, we reform that carbonyl. For our aldo, uh, we don't. We just protonate and then eliminate. So are there any questions on how aldo and chlysin are similar but different? No. OK. Um, so that being said, um, let's talk about this next question. Um, we're going to rank by the acidity of the most acidic alpha carbon in each molecule, or one is the most acidic. Um, so like we talked about in the review, um, the more resonance it does, um, the better, the more acidic it's going to be, right? So right off the bat, um, we, we can see that this one in the middle is going to be, you know, by far the most acidic. It, it has resonance with three different carbonyls, um, which is more than any of the other ones. Um, and then we, we can compare the other ones. Um, so we see that these two, um, these two diketones are obviously going to be more acidic than the just ketones um, that I, I didn't bracket over the top of. Um, so that being said, uh, we're now going to be comparing um, essentially the effect of that fluorine versus not having it. So fluorine is going to be an inductive group and specifically an electron withdrawing group. Uh, and so we see that with that fluorine there, the conjugate base of this um, is going to stabilize that negative charge a little bit, right? It's going to draw some of that lone pair towards itself which ultimately is going to make the conjugate base more stable, um, which is going to make that, um, that overall molecule more acidic. So we'll call that 2 and 3. Um, and then again, by the same logic, um, this, fluorinated mono uh, this fluorinated ketone is going to be um, more acidic than that, um, 
just regular ketone. Any questions about that? Okay, then if not, we'll move on. Okay, so now um, we want to decide whether each of these nucleophiles is going to undergo 1, 2 addition or 1, 4 addition to uh, this guy, right? So this is, again, just an alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. And like we've talked about, um, we know that that's a substrate for the Michael addition. Um, so that being said, um, we know that, like we just talked about, in order to undergo 1, 2 addition, um, we need a hard nucleophile because it's going to be irreversibly adding to the, um, to the carbonyl. Um, and for 1, 4 addition, we're going to need a soft nucleophile. Um, uh, add to the carbonyl. So that being said, um, what are we thinking about this this first one? CN. So this is actually maybe a little bit um, kind of a surprise, um, but we'll see that, that that's why we put it in here. So this CN. Um, is not a uh, not a very strong base. So what what that means ultimately is that um, it, it's it's going to pretty much reversibly add um, to that to that oxygen. So we'll see that that actually is going to do um, that'll actually do one four addition, I believe. Yeah. So that's going to be, in other words, that's going to act as a soft nucleophile. Um, versus this next one we already talked about is the Grignard, right? That's So the, the product of that is going to be a 1,4 addition. Um, so we're going to wind up getting uh, something that ultimately looks like uh, It's going to look like that uh, on the bottom, if you can see. Yeah, no worries. Um, and yeah, like like I said, that might be a little bit counterintuitive, um, just because you see, OK, it's a C minus. Um, but with that being said, um, really, the only, I'm going to say, um, the hard nucleophiles you should know are probably going to be um, your lithium. Um, your lithium reagents, your Grignard reagents, your um, acetylenes, right? right? So the uh, triple bond C minus. Um, and like we talked about uh, way in the first question of this problem set, um, any sources of hydride, right? Your, your reducing agents. Um, so that's a general good rule of thumb. And so that kind of like we just talked about um, these next two, the lithium reagent and the Grignard are going to be, um, you know, these hard nucleophiles. And so we'll do one, two addition with both of those. This next one, um, do you all know what that's called? Um, like what kind of reagent this is with, the, with copper and lithium? Yeah, it's going to be a cuprate. I believe it also goes by Gilman, right? So that's a that's a Gilman reagent, um, and Gilman reagents are also going to be um, soft nucleophiles. So that's going to be one four. And again, here's our, our Michael anion, um, which, as we know by this point, we we just talked about in the last question. 
um, is going to be another soft nucleophile, so it'll also add one four. Any questions about that? All right, then I'm going to go on to the next page here. Um, so now uh, the last couple pages of the, re uh, of the packet are just going to be just reactions. Um, so this first one, um, we have two carbonyls, right? And um, we're going to add uh, this first thing. And I'm going to specify that we're adding one equivalent. Um, so what's that first step going to do then? Yeah, we're going to form, exactly, we're going to protect the aldehyde with acetyl. Um So what that's going to look like is um, it's going to look like that, right? So that's our cyclic acetyl. Cool. And then what's our next thing going to do? Our green yard. Exactly. Our green yard is going to add to the ketone. And so we see um, one, two. So we'll have. That, right? Um, and then our last step is going to be H plus and H2O, which is going to have kind of two effects overall. Um, the first one, um, again, will just be um, pronation. Yeah, and we're going to also remove our protecting group. Perfect. So that's our, our final molecule. Any questions on that one? OK, uh, then we'll move on to the next one. Um, I'm actually going to clear it in between because I kind of ate up my space here. So I'm going to clear now. Um, all right, this next one. So all we have is an acid catalyst. Um, so that begs the question, what's in our molecule itself, right? And we see on one carbon, we have this ester. On the other, we have an alcohol, right, an OH. So I'm going to say alcohol. And we know that when we have esters and alcohols together, um, we're going to do transesterification, right? Basically, replace that guy with this guy. So since we're doing this intramolecularly, um, what I like to start with is numbering, right? So we're numbering from our carbonyl carbon all the way to our ester. Um, so we see that six overall. So that tells us that we're going to wind up with a six-membered ring. So I'll do this. Um, and then we can form the ester between those two. And actually, that's I'm going to draw it without the stereochemistry so it's a little more clear. Um, going to look something like that in the box. And I added an extra carbon there, sorry. So yeah, when you're doing um, intramolecular reactions in general, um, 
or I guess any reaction, but especially intramolecular reactions, it's a really good practice to number so that you don't add or lose any carbons. Um, any questions on part B? So yeah, this is going to be called transesterification. And the reason for that is because um, we're, we're taking one ester and making it into another ester. Uh, so the proton is, um, it catalyzes this, right? So all the proton's going to do is it's going to, this, if we're looking at the mechanism, um, it's going to attack, the carbonyl is going to attack it um, to essentially catalyze this nucleophilic attack. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Good. Any other questions on that one? OK, if not, then we can move on. So uh, for C, um, what are we doing? I, I guess the first question I should ask is, what, what do we have here? What kind of molecule? It's going to be an acetal, right? You can see that because we have this one oxygen with, uh, or sorry, this one carbon with two, two separate oxygens attached. So basically, two ethers of the same carbon. So that being said, um, if we're uh, if we're putting that in just an acid solution that's going to catalyze um, essentially the breakup of that acetal into um, in, into our corresponding ketone. So rather than showing out the whole mechanism for this, there's a little kind of shortcut I like to use. Um, and that's specifically um, whatever carbon has two oxygens attached to it. Um, is going to wind up turning into our ketone, right? Or in, in general, our carbonyl. And then we break the our corresponding alcohol, right? So if we do that, the whole molecule looks like uh, something like this. And bear with me here. Um, I'm going to number so that we don't lose anything. One, two, three, four, five, and then six there. And we have our OH. And then on this carbon, we have an ethyl group. And then going the other way, So it should look something like that. Oh, and then another alcohol on there. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is, um, I think, a more complex um, molecule to do that than anything y'all will get, but uh, in, in general, it's the same, you know, same kind of um, same kind of process. And just so we're clear, I will make sure that red carbon is what was over here, right? And then.
I believe this should be on that Carmen. My apologies. That. And this is why numbering in carbons is important. Uh, but are there any questions on that in general? If we did a simpler one, like here, let me let me come up with an, a simpler one here. Um, so if we take um, this over here, um, we're going to see, first of all, that it's not cyclic, right? So we'll wind up essentially liberating some sort of alcohol. Um, and we will see that carbonyl carbon is there, right? The one with two oxygens. So if we separate that there, then we see that's going to be our carbonyl. And the stuff on the other side, basically, this thing, methanol, is going to be our alcohol. And so that's going to be what we get. Um, are there any questions on breaking an acetal in general, or hydrolyzing an acetal, I should say? Um, if not, then we can move on to D. Um, so D, um, we already kind of talked about this. Um, we see our phosphorus elide, and I suppose we should have NaOH there. Um, we have our phosphorus elide, and we have a ketone, so obviously we're doing the Wittig reaction, right? Um, and again, kind of like I alluded to before, um, when we do Wittig, um, I like to line up my, um, line up my ketone with, um, with this. So we have our, we have that, this, and then we just have an H and the methyl group. And so we see, um, that when we kind of combine those, um, this stuff leaves, and we form a double bond between the rest of it, which in this case looks like that. Any questions on that one? And again, once you line it up like this, it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, going forward, we see for E, um, here we have uh, dibol, right? So that's a reducing agent. Um, and water at the end, so hydrolysis. So what dibol is going to do is um, pretty much, uh, it's going to reduce our ester, I believe, right? Um, let me pull up that chart. Um, so this is a fairly good chart to use. Um, and we see that when we have an ester, Dibol reduces it to the corresponding aldehyde, right? So that's good to remember. Um, but then when we have a nitrile, it's also going to reduce that to our aldehyde, right? So let's go back to problem set here. And so we see that. Um, that's what we're going to get, right? We're just going to get our two um, our two aldehydes, and then this H two O um, 
is, I believe, just to um, just work up. Any questions on that one? All right, then we'll keep going. Um, part F here. So we have two two parts to this reaction. Um, this first part um, is, is, I guess, still two parts in itself. So the Cl2, the halogenation, um, is going to ultimately going to go all the way. Uh, yeah, so sorry, uh, we'll go back here. So you asked what happened to the Cn. Um, in general, and I'm going to show this for just a um, Cn, in you know, a simpler molecule. When we take that and react that with dibol, um, I'll answer that question. Actually, I I don't know the answer to your question. Um, if there was only one equivalent, I, I don't know about selectivity with producing agents, um, and I'm not sure whether you would have to either. But that's that's a good question. I would ask your professor. Um, but anyway, uh, it, assuming we have enough reducing agent, um, dibol with a with a um, with the nitrile is essentially going to keep that same C and reduce it to the aldehyde. And then we'll get um, ammonia as a, as a byproduct. And then we can see this C stays, right? And then this nitrogen over there um, turns into ammonia. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, no worries. Um, all right, so back to this next one. Um, again, we have two parts, um, or three parts overall. Um, two parts of this first reaction. So uh, our first step is going to be chlorination, where we're going to essentially chlorinate this uh, as much as we can. And we're specifically um, focused on, on this, right? On chlorinating our alpha carbon. And then once we have that, that makes that carbon into a fairly good leaving group. Um, so what this sodium hydroxide is going to do after that is pretty much serve like our nucleophilic attack. And it's going to cause that to leave. Um, obviously, that's not the mechanism, but overall, that's what happens. So I'm going to show it like that. So we wind up forming our And then we react with two equivalents of this lithium reagent. Um, so let's do one at a time. So what's that first, um, what's that first equivalent of the lithium reagent going to do? Are we going to directly attack the? Um, are we going to directly attack this carbonyl carbon, or is there something that has to happen first? Is there something that it's more preferably reacted with? Yeah, exactly. Right. We're gonna we're gonna deprotonate. Um, so it's important to remember that um, lithium reagents and um, and Grignard reagents, in addition to being uh, strong nucleophiles, are also strong bases. So if we're in, um, you know, uh, if we're in a protic solvent or if we have some sort of protic, um, protic reagent, um, the f is this deprotonation. And so, that's what we wind up forming with our first equivalent of lithium. And then when we do another, that's when we'll see um, you know, what we'd expect to see with a nucleophilic attack. Uh, and so we'll show that product here. And so that would be our product. Any questions?
So it's not going to attack twice because the first equivalent, so since we only have two equivalents, um, the first equivalent of this lithium is going to be completely used up in deprotonating, right? And then we only have one equivalent of lithium, of lithium reagent left. So that's going to attack, and then we're out of lithium, which is why it doesn't attack again. If we said, for example, um, like way excess, so instead of two, we say excess. Um, I guess I'll do that in a, in a different color. If we say excess is blue, um, then we'll attack again, right? Uh, oops, sorry, that's not a double bond. Single bond. And we'll wind up with our alcohol instead. Good question. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, if not, then we can move on to G. Um, so if they don't say excess, we can assume X, right? And so what we see here um, is our green yard is going to attack our ester once. Right, and as we know, that um, that alkoxide is going to act as a leaving group, and so we get um, a ketone at first, and then we still have green yarn floating around in solution. So we are going to attack twice in this case, right? And with workup, so I'm going to say plus H plus. So yeah, this is this is uh, what happens when we when we have excess and we add again, right? Any questions on that one? If not, then we can keep going. So um, as so part H here. Um, we have our, um, I believe they call it hydrozone or something like that. Uh, I might be wrong. Um, but yeah, we have basically our ammonia with an OH substituent. Um, and when we see pretty much any amine derivative with carbonyl, uh, we know that we're going to start that with nucleophilic attack. And so, Let's do that. So we have this. Um, and now what we're going to see is um, a, a proton transfer, right? Um, to, so that's a plus. So we see a proton transfer. That's this. Um, and then what we see is um, if we're in acid, um, acid solution, which we are, um, we'll see that this oxygen will also be protonated. And so we'll find um, that that leaves as a leaving group. Uh, and we form Uh, that. And then again, we just deprotonate again and we wind up forming this oxine. And then um, once we take our oxine um, and we reduce it, uh, we'll see that the oxine just kind of reduces into uh, this. So basically, we add hydrogen here, and 
we have these two hydrogens. Any questions on that? So ultimately, if we're just kind of skipping from here, um, we're first going to see we create our oxine like that. So we replace, you know, where our carbonyl was. And then when we reduce that, that's going to give us an H2 there. Uh, any questions on that in general? Okay. Um, then how clear that and we'll keep going. Um, so our next one, we have a nitrile and our green yard. So what we see here, um, recall that um, Recall that the nitrile pretty much serves as um, the nitrile serves as a or the nitrile is a carboxylic acid derivative. So what we're going to see um, is, is essentially uh, we're going to kind of attack that um, like we would, um, like we would otherwise. And so we will attack that uh, and kick that up. So we form. This um, and then what we'll do after that is essentially put in some um, some acid water, right? And uh, what that's going to do is um, again, it's going to hydrolyze it, and what it's going to do is make this nitrogen into a carbonyl, and so we wind up with that overall. And the reason we don't add here again is because, oh, can y'all not see the writing on the bottom? Part I. You can see it? Interesting. Um, try zooming out all the way and then refreshing. Um, I'm going to keep going here while you try and figure that out. So. Uh, the reason we don't add here again is because, first of all, there's um, we we aren't going to reform our our nitrile, right? Because there's no leaving group here. We have we just have two carbons, um, and there's nothing to protonate this, right? We know that we can't add Grignard in a protic solution because our Grignard will um, deprotonate whatever instead of instead of doing nucleophilic attack, and so we're kind of just left with this. Um, this anion here. And then that's when we add our acid water, right? And we're going to get some, uh, some imine, and that imine will also be um, hydrolyzed into our ketone. Any questions on that? All right. And then I'm going to keep moving. So J, um, here we have uh, secondary amine, right? So there's our secondary amine and uh, carboxylic acid. So I'm going to say CA. Um, and we know that um, kind of what's ultimately going to happen here is um, this OH is going to be replaced with this nitrogen. So we, we can show that right off the bat, right? Nitrogen, and um, this nitrogen has a propyl group on it, one, two, three, and then um, methyl with a terp pro or with an isopropyl attached. So that's ultimately what we're going to get, right? This is amide. And it's helpful to look at that in the case of a reaction. Um, but I do want to point out that um, we're also going to have to, um, or, or we're going to have kind of the mechanism of, um, we talked about before, um, where, where we're going to form the imine and then tautomerize, right? So what we'll see is we form, um, we keep that OH there, and we form um, 
I'm just going to show them as R groups rather than redrawing. So we're going to form this imine, right? Or sorry, in this case, since it's secondary, um, we're going to form. I apologize about that. We're going to form um, our, our enamine, right? And then that's going to tautomerize, right? Here we see that this is a null. So we're actually going to wind up tautomerizing um, to get to our amide, um, which is the same as that. Any questions on that? OK. Um, so this next one, K, um, what do y'all see? So let me start with that. Um, this first molecule. Um, is something we've seen before. It's that alpha beta unsaturated um, unsaturated ketone, right? So alpha beta unsat ketone. Um, and then it's not going to be well. It's it's kind of a Michael, um, but there's a more specific name for it than that. Um, and, and you'll see what I mean in a second here. So we have that alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And then here we have um, a cyclic ketone, right? And yeah, it's going to be a Robinson, uh, a Robinson annulation. And so uh, the way that we, we kind of do Robinson annulation um, is we're going to line up. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the guide again um, from in the PowerPoint um, because it's really is really helpful. So I apologize, I keep switching back and forth. So um, here's, here's kind of the shortcut that we're going to use, right? So essentially, we line up, um, we take our cyclic ketone, and we line up um, our alpha carbon with the carbonyl, right? And you line up this alpha carbon with R4. So there's kind of, there are two things going on here, right? In one case, uh, or in one part of our reaction, we have this kind of, um, we, we have this like aldo condensation going on, right? Where we take our alpha carbon and attack the carbonyl. So that's like an aldol. And then this other part is going to be like this one, uh, this one for Michael addition, right? This is going to be like the one for Michael addition. So what we ultimately see then is that um, this uh, this aldo part um, is going to wind up, um, you know, doing doing that attack and then eliminating, and that gives us a double bond there, right, between our cyclic. So we have a double bond um, between our cyclic ketone, um, cyclic ketone carbon, I should say, uh, and our, um, I'm going to call it the alpha beta um, for short, uh, and the alpha beta alpha carbon. <laughs> um, maybe I should have come up with a better name for that. But anyway, uh, y'all see what I mean, right? So our, um, our cyclic ketones, carbonyl carbon, and our um, al the other alpha carbon, right, um, of this uh, alpha beta uh, unsaturated carbonyl. And then again, on the other side, we have our cyclic ketones alpha carbon, right? So I'll write this out too. So and then on the other side, we see a single bond. Uh, and that's, again, from the Michael addition side of things, um, a single bond between our cyclic ketone alpha carbon and um, our, our beta carbon, right? 
um, and the beta carbon of our alpha beta unsaturated carbon U. And we can also think of that as the four carbon, right? For for one four addition. And I will I'll leave this up for just a minute here so y'all can kind of get your bearings. And I'll actually draw those other uh, molecules from the packet over here. So we can do it in this context. So we, we see, um, and I'm going to draw it to match this. So our first reagent um, in that packet, if you're still looking um, at it on your own screen, is going to look like that, right? So we can tell, um, I mean, it's the same molecule as this, right? That's our um, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. And I'm going to abbreviate it there. And then our other one is going to be um, our cyclic, uh, our cyclic ketone. I apologize for the the lack of prettiness there. Um, and then it's going to look something like something like that, right? And you can see I drew it so that we we line it up in exactly the way they tell us to here. We have Again, cyclic. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep uh, keep emphasizing this cyclic um, cyclic ketones carbonyl by our alpha carbon, and we have the other alpha carbon by the four carbon. And so once we do this, um, we see a double bond form between those two, and a single bond form between these two. And then this um, this is ultimately going to disappear, right? And so what we wind up with overall is, um, and I'll number here so we don't lose any, um, so we don't lose any carbon. So we have a six membered ring there, right? So there's our six membered ring. Um, here's our five from, from previous. And then between our one and two carbons of that six membered ring, we know we just formed a double bond. Our three carbon still has that, um, still has that ketone. Uh, four and five, we, we know we got rid of that double bond. Uh, six, we don't have anything other than that ring. And then once we go and decorate the rest of the, uh, the five carbon ring, um, which essentially remains untouched, then we're done. So that's our final product of uh, this Robinson annulation problem. Are there any questions on that? And yeah, if you're still having um, trouble kind of trying to work through those, um, I would definitely refer to this PowerPoint after um, as you're doing more practice. So I'm going to start navigating back to the packet then. Uh, any questions that, on this at all before I um, I believe the PowerPoint will be sent out uh, to email, by email after the session. Uh, if not, it's also in the, um, I posted the link before, which I can, it will be um, that box link I just sent in the chat. Um, you should be able to access it there as well. Okay, so. Yeah, no worries. Um, the recording will be on the peer tutoring YouTube channel, and I believe you will receive a link to that by email uh, in the in the coming days. Um, yes, of course. Uh, can I can I clear this screen? All right. I didn't get any notes, so I'm gonna switch back to the packet now. OK, so uh, we're on to L. So um, what do we see here? We have um, so we have this, right, um, which is an alkoxide, right? The potassium is just a counter ion. Um, so 
our first reaction um, might be to take that and attack the carbonyl. Um, but that's not, that, that might happen a little bit, but we'll also see um, kind of for the same reason that we talked about with Michael, um, with Michael addition, that this is just gonna also pop right off as well. So um, what we'll see here um, is that we wanna actually form our, uh, our enolate, right? So let's do that. And I'll, I'm gonna show it here. I know I showed that carbon being taken off, but it's symmetrical, so it doesn't matter too much. So we do that. Um, and then we know um, that we have more of this in solution. And so what we'll do um, is now attack like that, right? And so that gives us this, um, uh, here, bear with me here. This is, <laughs> so we're going to form this, um, if you recall, it's going to be our beta hydroxy ketone. Right, because we have a hydroxy, a hydroxyl group on our beta carbon. And now what we're going to do with heat and subtracting H2O is our um, illumination, right? So all we're going to do there then is essentially form our double bond between those two. Um, so just to be clear, we're taking off those two as water and forming a double bond here, which once we redraw it, looks like that. Um, and if we name that, that's gonna be an aldo condensation, right? Any questions on that? And I guess, I, I don't think we pointed this out, but just one real quick thing. If you're having trouble remembering what aldol is, um, I, I guess for me, uh, we have the, the ketone, or which also can be an aldehyde, right? So that's our ald, and we wind up making an alcohol once we attack, right? So all. And that's how we get our aldol reaction, because we wind up having an, an aldehyde and an alcohol in our product together. And I guess this, this can be a ketone as well, but aldol sounds better, I guess. Um, so yeah, are there any questions on part L? Okay, uh, then we'll move on to M here. So, uh, now, um, what do we think about this one? What, what does it look like? Um, so we have our base and heat as a reagent. Um, so with that kind of immediately, yeah, we're, it, it definitely looks like it's going to be something intramolecular. And specifically, it's looking like intramolecular aldol, right? So um, what we'll do is we'll, um, since we're looking at intramolecular aldol, we want to, you know, number. Um, we want a number to see basically where we can form our, um, form our rings, right? So um, I want to point out here that this nitrogen is going to kind of specify um, which aldo we, or sorry, which alpha carbon we end up using, right? So let's let's check this out real quick. If we try going from that alpha carbon, we see that's a seven-membered ring, right? So that's not going to help us because um, we know we can't form seven-membered rings. 
Um, but we still want to try and use um, the one, basically, the one closer to the nitrogen, because that nitrogen is an electron withdrawing group, right? So it's going to um, essentially make the alpha, um, the alpha protons closer to it, more acidic, right? It's going to kind of um, stabilize that conjugate base a little bit by drawing away some of that electron, some of those electrons. Um, so since that seven carbon didn't work, uh, we'll, we'll try this other alpha carbon. Uh, three, that's a three. Um, so this works, right? We, we can see that we can form um, a bond between our one and five carbons. Um, so, so we'll do that. Um, we have five carbons, so we know right off the bat it's going to be five carbon ring. And for our mental sanity, I'll number that ring as well. Um, on the one carbon, uh, we see this this kind of um, carbonyl and amine that's not going to wind up changing. So we'll add that on. Um, in H2, right? And on the five carbon, we know that um, that's going to start off as this OH, right? Because we're um, we're attacking that carbonyl and making it into an, an OH. And then since we have heat, we're going to wind up eliminating that further, right? And so we still have all this stuff, but then we wind up forming um, we wind up forming that double bond there. Uh, any questions on that? All right, then we'll move on to N here. So um, part N, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that's you can you can tell that that's when you do go it um, when you go the other way, right? So basically, when you take um, this alpha carbon here that we marked four and attacked um, this carbonyl, um, I think you would get credit for either. Um, but I believe the way we did it is more correct, um, just because um, this is going to be slightly more acidic, but very slightly. Yeah. And that's the thing about a whole lot of these, um, these reactions in this chapter. They're either equilibrium or they have kind of a competing reaction. So you will get more than one product. Um, okay, so part N, um, basically the dead giveaway for a Clydes and condensation in general is that we have an ester and it matches, and, and our reagent matches whatever that ester is, right? Um, so what we're going to do here is um, form our alpha carbon. Uh, sorry, form our enolate by deprotonating our alpha carbon. And we're going to deprotonate this one in particular because um, it's much more acidic than that one, right? And that's because it has extra resonance, right? It's between two, two carbonyls. And so we now have our nucleophile, and they say we're going to react it with this electrophile. So excuse me, I misspoke. Uh, it, it's not quizin. It's... Um, it's just uh, making our, you know. So again, we're, we're going back to the good old days of just doing SN2. And so we have that, right? Um, perfect. And then 
um, we see the end is going to be acid hydrolysis um, with heat. So there are kind of two things that are going to go on here. Um, the first is that we see our ester hydrolyze into an acid, right? So our ester hydrolyzes into an acid. Cool. And then um, if y'all remember, there's a very specific thing that we have happen um, with this kind of molecule. And, and for time's sake, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that this is what we call um, a beta or uh, a beta keto acid um, or carboxylic acid. And that's because, again, we have uh, an acid, a carboxylic acid on the beta carbon of our ketone. Uh, and when we have that and we apply heat, um, essentially what we see happen is uh, that's going to leave as, um, as carbon dioxide and leave us with um, basically whatever our, our ketone was. So the shortcut for this is very simple. You cut that off and you, you write whatever you have left. And that's going to be this with a hydrogen wherever our carboxylic acid was. And so that's going to be our final product. Um, and with that, we're just about out of time. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If not, um, thank you all for coming out today. Um, we really appreciate it. We hope today was helpful. Um, good luck on your exam this coming week. Bye, everyone.